been out Monday and Tuesday, fever spikes to like 100. So it's going around. Uh, whether it's COVID or flu, it is what it is, right? Sickness is sickness in mind. So I'm going to apologize beforehand if I'm sniffling a lot. I'll try not to because I get told about it after service every time I do it. But a few announcements. Again, prayer requests. Please put it back in the, in the offering box. We'd love to pray for that for you. And um, if you would like that to get like passed along, so if you have a prayer request, just let us know and we'll, we'll email it or, or signal. We use signal. Um, if you would like to be part of that, uh, if there are, for those watching or, or here, um, we have a lady signal group and a guy signal group where we share uh, prayer requests and, and just kind of announcements or even encouraging devotions or something you read. So if you'd like to join that, talk to Casey and I, and we'll let you know. And again, December 10th, I thought, boy, we have a lot of time, but we don't have a lot of time till December 10th. Um, we'll be having our potluck and prophecy updates. So we rented the building from like 9 to 2.30. So join us for that. And again, the world is on fire, is it not? And how much more we need the word of God. This is all the places you can find us. And this week too, I wanted to recommend these two books. I know I put, they found the secret last week, but Chuck Smith's Living Water is a great book on the gifts of the Spirit, um, about the Holy Spirit in general, and just really good um, theology uh, based in scripture. Um, so it's a great read. I just finished it again and uh, before we started Acts. And it's just encouraging because I believe the gifts are alive. They're for today. Um, they're working today. And uh, those that say otherwise, well, they can answer to the Holy Spirit. So not to me. So um I'm going to open in prayer. I'm going to do it a little different today. And then we're going to read all of Acts chapter 1. And then like we do, we'll start at verse 9, back up, and go through it. So, Father, just be with us here today. Lord, last week uh, we read, as Jesus said, he promised the Holy Spirit, Lord. So we would ask for that promise today, Lord, that you would be in this place, that you would fill it. Um, like the song we just said, Lord, may your word speak to us, Lord. May we be still. May we hear it. Uh, still me, Lord, calm, calm me, take away any nerves, take away anything I want to say, Lord, and replace it with what you want to say today. So open your word to us, help us to hear it, help us to be convicted where we need to be, help us to be lifted up where we need to be, um, and help us just to see you clearly, Lord. Help us to wait where we need to wait upon you, Lord, as you press that on me this week. So we ask all these things, and before I close, Lord, be with those who are sick, uh, we pray for healing for their bodies, Lord, and be with those that are traveling. Give them traveling mercies, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 1. Again, we only went eight verses last week, so I feel like just to get a really good running start and context, we're just going to read the whole chapter, and then we will move through starting in verse 9. So the former account I made, O Theopolis, of all Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them now not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seas in which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast toward the heavens as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in the like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Verse 13. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room 
where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, they num the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture has to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open into the middle, and his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called with their own language, Akel Dama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who accomplished us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed too, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two have you chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This chapter, in many ways, is going to be the close of an Old Testament theme. After this, they're going to be much more guided by the Holy Spirit. And the big debate, as we get to the end of it, should Matthias have been chosen? Should it have been Paul? And if you, I read four different commentaries, and two were on one side and two were on the other, and I trust all of them. So we'll get to that as we get to the end. But it says, as we start in verse 9, where we come to, that when he had spoken these things, so remember the last thing he says is verse 8. And again, last things spoken are very important. This is what Jesus wanted to impart to them as he leaves earth with his public ministry. He's going to ascend up. He said he spoke these things, and while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of his sight. There's a lot of discussion about that cloud. Some think it has the very glory of God in it as he ascends up. And it said they stood there just looking, and I can imagine them all just standing there with heads up in the air, watching him fade away, because this is different, right? For the past 40 days, he had walked into the room and then walked out, and nobody you know, phasing in, phasing out. They had seen him go back and forth doing this over and over again for 40 days. This is a different way to leave. He's making it very known to them that he's not coming back. Not, not the way he had been. And what he leaves with them is verse 8. And it's funny how many people, when they start churches and they start programs, they need to come up with a five-year and a ten-year plan. Jesus didn't leave them with a five-year or a ten-year plan. He didn't tell them what kind of church government to form. He didn't tell them if they should use chairs or pews. He didn't tell them that service would be on Sunday or Saturday. He didn't tell them any of these things. He said, go and wait for the Holy Spirit. And that's all he left them with. It's, it said uh, a, a early commentator, early historian uh, named Lightfoot said within the first century there was over 10 different forms of church government already. So they, there was no instruction for that. Were they wrong? Were they right? I don't think so. I think God left it very open to, to organize it how they want to. But there goes Jesus. His, it is, he ascends. It says, this same Jesus, it says. So the one you saw go is the one that's coming back. Anybody that says that they are a different Jesus or a different kind of Jesus, and isn't it what that the whole world wants today? They want a different kind of Jesus. They want a Jesus that is accepting of anything and everything that they do. They want a Jesus that is just love. He is not holy. He is not just. He is just love. No, this same Jesus that they saw go, who was very clear about a lot of things the world doesn't want him to be clear about, is going to come back. He left physically. He will return physically. He left visibly. He will return visibly. Isn't that cool? I can't wait to see him come back. He left from the Mount of Olives. He will return to the Mount of Olives. 
He left in the presence of his disciples. Guess what? He'll be coming back in the presence of his disciples. He left with a blessing for the church, and so it will be. This is the end. This is the end of his public ministry, and he's handing the battalion off to these guys. In John, 2 John 1, 7, it says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The tenses in the Greek there are a participle in the present tense, which means it should be translated, is coming in the flesh. In other words, he's coming back, he's coming back in the flesh. There is a whole sect of people that I've listened to, I thought they were good believers, but as I read this verse, they're called full preterist. I know you really wanted to learn that word today. It means they believe all the, all the prophecy in the Bible is done. It's over. We are actually past the millennium. We're past all of that. This is heaven. And they don't believe Jesus is coming back physically. It says right here that this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So I don't know. I wouldn't listen to him anymore. I shoot him away. They say a lot of good things about a lot of stuff. But the participle, again, it's very, very clear. Jesus left physically. He's returning physically. And when he does, and this ran through my head because we're coming upon Christmas season, right? It's almost Thanksgiving, so it's time to start singing Christmas carols, right? It's the way it goes. Isaiah 9, 7, and when he comes again, by the way, of the un increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Does that not put a smile on your face? Guess what, Washington? His government, there's no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward. Even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He's coming back again. He's coming back physically. You can't vote him out of office. You cannot reject him as king. He will be king and he will rule and reign. And it says there will be no end. And we can't wait for that, right? That's our hope. So guess what, Moscow? Guess what, Israel? Guess what, all these other countries, D.C., White House? This is the true king, and he's coming again. And you either accept it now or you accept it later. There will be no other terms. So he's coming back. He's coming back the way he came. He wanted to make that clear. That's why he ascended the way he did. And I love the angels, right, the two angels. Some people think that this is Moses and Elijah. I think it's angels because we see a lot of angels actually through Acts. They're very involved in Acts. Remember when Peter's in jail at one point, two angels will wake him up, say, Peter, get your shoes on. Peter, get dressed. Peter, come on, let's go. And he thinks he's having a dream and these angels take him outside and finally he snaps out of it and he realizes, oh, this wasn't a dream. These were angels taking me out of prison. We're going to see the angel appear to Philip and he's going to get like teleported. It's pretty neat. He just gets to picked up and taken and placed somewhere else at one point. We're going to see angels appear to Cornelius. Angels are a big part of the New Testament. Isn't that fun? And if you think about it, and as we pray about it, they are here today. They are on guard, I believe, around this building doing whatever angels do. I think they're very logical. Like I, like I said before, I think they're kind of like Spock. They're just, it's logic, right? Like they're looking at these guys. They're like, why are you standing here looking? He's gone. And when they came to the tomb, he's like, why are you looking in the tomb? He's not here anymore. You know, it's very logical to them. It's very calculated. This is the angels. So we're going to see lots of angels and acts. And again, they're fun, but they are nothing to be worshipped. They are nothing to be revered. Some of them are fallen and they're not good guys anymore. In the Bible, there's really only four angels named that at least, I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, but Michael, it says the prince or the archangel. That's a definite title. That means he is the singular only archangel. Then there's Gabriel. He seems to go around and make announcements. And then, of course, we have Lucifer. He's the son of the fallen. It says that he was a cherub in Isaiah. And then in, in Revelation, we have Apollyon. We see him at the end of Revelation. So there are the four angels that would seem to appear throughout Scripture. If you want a really good book on angels, I should have put that up too. Billy Graham did a book on angels. It's real small. It's really good. I read it. It's fantastic. And he wrote that because so many people wrote books about Satan. He thought, what about God's angels, right? What about him? We don't, we don't talk about them. So he took the scriptures and he wrote a book on angels. So it's Billy Graham's book on angels. It's fantastic. It's a good, very quick, easy read. So verses 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem. They're finally being obedient. From the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Peter 
Peter's first. Peter will always be named first. We'll notice James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Jealot, Zealot, Judas, the son of James. And this is the important part. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the whips. Finally, they were obedient. Jesus says, go to Jerusalem. We, that's why we did the whole chapter in context. They go to Jerusalem and they wait. But they're not just waiting. It says that they continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. It says with the woman, one, one commentator said this is actually their wives. When we get to the next verse, we'll see there's 120 in this room. We see Mary, and this is the last time we see Mary mentioned. This is it. And she's there. She's praying. She's waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Notice nobody is praying to her. They are praying with her. They are praying for the Holy Spirit to come. She is a part of that. It's awesome that she's named. It's wonderful. Again, I think the Catholic Church takes it too far, but I think a lot of the Protestant churches haven't taken it far enough. She is honored above all women. And like I've said before, this is one person I hope in heaven I can have time to sit down to and ask, what was he like when he was little? Was he good? Was he bad? Did he like break stuff? Was there accidents? How did that all work? I want to know all these things, right? We, we love him. We know him. I want to know all about him. So this is the only person that knows from the beginning all the way to the Holy Spirit falls. She's there. So she is blessed among all women, but again, she's not to be prayed to. She is just a woman, and I think she would be uphold if she found out um, that in some places of the Catholic Church, they actually revere her as co-redemptress. In one of the Catholic churches, I can't remember where, I just read it this week, they actually have half Jesus on the cross and half her. That's how far they take it. It's too far. That's not what Mary was. And again, she would be uphold, I think, if she saw that. No more mention of her. She falls off the scene. She falls into history. And we believe John takes her in like he said he were. And then we see Jesus says his brothers are there. So we know James and Jude, they're there. They're praying with him. Again, the Catholic Church doesn't like that because they believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. But his brothers are there. And that just reminds me they didn't believe when he was alive. And if you're praying for family, don't quit. Imagine there's Jesus doing all these miracles. They had grown up with him, and when they were alive, they did not believe in him. In fact, at one point it said when he claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath, they came and they said they thought he was crazy. And, they, and he, Jesus looked at the crowd and said, who are my mothers and my brothers? Those that follow the word of God, right? So there's his brothers. They're gathered, and I'm sure that blessed Jesus. He's still in some ways 100% human too, right? 100% human, 100% God. And there's his brothers, James and Jude. James will stand up and he will become head of what seems like the church in Jerusalem and will eventually be martyred. He'll be thrown off the top of the, of the temple. So they're, they're all gathered. But again, the most important part to me is they're all continued in one accord. And again, this is a theme through Acts we're going to see. In Acts 2, 42 through 43, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then, and I like to add this verse, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. It's interesting that it says then, and we'll get to this when we get in chapter 2. It says they continued in the doctrine and the fellowship and in prayers, and again, they're in one accord. This word, one accord, I'm not going to try to say it, so I put it on a slide. That word is a compound of two words. It means to rush along and in unison. We see it 11 or 12 times total in the Bible, but 11 of those times are here in Acts. But they are in one accord and they rush along. Isn't it interesting how in 1 Corinthians, as Paul begins to write to it, there's all these crazy sins going on. And I know I brought this up before, but I think it's so important. They're getting drunk at the communion table. Somebody's sleeping with their stepmom. All these craziness. But the first issue he, Paul addresses is division within the church. The first thing Satan wants to do here in a church is divide us. He wants us to be fighting. He wants us to be backbiting. He wants us divided with the other churches. Look, there's things we can agree upon with the other churches, right? The other denominations, absolutely. As long as they believe Jesus is God, he died, rose again on the third day, and he's coming again, I don't see why we can't have fellowship with them in some things, right? 
But he, he wants us divided because he knows if we're divided, we cannot stand alone. Satan likes to get us alone. That was his first tactic in the Garden of Eden, of Eden, of Eve, with Eve. In Eden with Eve. That's what I'm trying to say, right? To get her alone, and then he, he took her down. So his, his strategy has not changed. He wants to divide the church. He wants to get in here and divide us. He does not want us to be in one accord. He does not want us to be in prayer with each other. He, he does not want us to be in supplication. We're going to see prayer is an important part of Acts. Very, very important. They pray all the time. They pray together. They are praying alone. And when they pray, something happens. Do not doubt when we pray, something is happening in the spiritual realm. We can't see it. We don't know it. But do not doubt when we pray, something is happening. Stephen will pray as he's being stoned to death and he gets to see heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Peter will pray and he'll raise someone from the dead. <clears throat> Peter will also be praying alone when the sheet will come down and, from, and he'll be told to go witness to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Cornelius will pray and ask God to come and show him how to be saved. And God will send somebody. They'll pray, jail doors will be open, salvation will come, the Holy Spirit will fall, missionaries will be sent out, and that all happens when they pray. The four big things that are in, in Acts that we need to see is the Holy Spirit, that power that we talked about last week, prayer, and a witness. Those are the words that are repeated over and over and the themes that are throughout this book. A church that is alive will have those four things. They will have the Holy Spirit flowing through the place, which will give them the power. They will be in prayer, and they will be a witness to those around us. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, said, Prayer is the shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. So be in unison, be in prayer, alone, together. If you're married, you should be praying together. We do it. <laughs> As often as we, we can, we should do it more. We slack sometimes and we'll wane. And then Casey will look at me, we need to pray together. I'm like, I know. But it's the first thing that goes, isn't it? And I've said this over and over again. It's the first thing that goes. I will make sure I will get up. I will do my reading. And then I'll be like, oh, no, I need to get out the door for work. And that prayer time, I'll be in the car. Hey, Lord, you know, bless today. Da, 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 and this and that. It's the first thing that goes is the time that I set aside for the Lord to pray. And it's probably one of the most important things I do. And I don't know why, but it's the first thing, again, that will go. We'll get so busy. And it is the hardest thing to focus to do, is it not? Or am I the only one? Am I just? It's all of us, right? It is the hardest thing because things are going through your head. You're thinking, I need to go A, B, C. I got this to do. I got that to do. Oh, Lord, where was that? I was just in, you know, right before your throne. We were praying, and I'm so distracted. I'm so all over the place. And he's just saying, can you stop and be with me for a few minutes? Can you just settle down and take some time and speak with me? Because i got things I want to say to you, too. And it's always the first one to go. Here they are. They're in one accord. They're praying. And it says the, that they're in supplication. The idea of supplication here is the sense of desperation and earnestness. They are desperate for their Jesus who left them. Are we desperate for Jesus? Do we pray in desperation for him? But I love that they're together. And isn't that us? That's the church today. We're all over the place, aren't we? We dress different. We look different. We have different cultures. We have different struggles, but the solution is the same. It's Jesus. And he's the one that brings us together. He's the one that will bring unity. And again, when we seek the Holy Spirit, will come upon us, and he wants to bring unity. But again, we have to be on guard because it is Satan that will want to divide. He wants to get in, and he wants to interrupt, and he wants to interrupt here. He wants to interrupt this work that we're doing, and don't doubt it. I'm sure he's already trying to get a foothold in many doors to make us struggle, to make us separate, to be like not liking each other or backbiting each other or whatever it may be. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. 15 through 20, and in those days, Peter stood up. And isn't that funny? Peter always is standing up, isn't he? He's standing up when he should. He's standing up when he shouldn't. He's saying things he should. He's saying good things. You know, Jesus will turn around and look at him one time and say, bless you, Peter. You know, this hasn't been revealed to you from, 
by the Father, you know, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Another time, Jesus is going to turn around and tell him, rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. Peter is always standing up speaking. But he's a leader. We saw a week before, two weeks ago, I guess, at the end of John, when he, they all went out fishing. Peter said, I'm going fishing. And seven of the 11 went with him. And they just go. Peter's always standing up. I like that. And here we get the exact number. It says 120 are there. And in verse 16, he says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled. I like that. Which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in the ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open into the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. Thanks for that, Peter. And it came to be known in the, those dwellings in Jerusalem, so the field was called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is the field of blood. And then Peter quotes Psalms. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. So Peter, again, he's standing up, and the first thing he says is Scripture has to be fulfilled. And where did he get that? If we look through what Jesus was teaching them, and I imagine the 40 days as Jesus was appearing in and out and teaching them, Jesus was showing them that he must be crucified according to the scriptures, that he must be buried and he must rise again according to the scriptures. So Peter's looking through and he's he's reading Psalms. This is the first time we see Peter quoting from scripture. That's pretty cool. The first time he's finally... Stepping up and, and, again, quoting scripture, and he's reading these psalms, and he's seeing something that has to be fulfilled. Now, remember, they were told at one point that there was 12 thrones in heaven. We'll see, and I have it up here. We'll get to it. Revelation, it says that there's 12 gates with the 12 apostles um, written on it. So he understands that this has to be fulfilled. So he stands up, he reads these psalms, he, he sees that this needs to be fulfilled. And it, again, it's the idea that scripture must be fulfilled. He sees that the the scripture is Holy Spirit inspired, that the Psalms is spoken by David is Holy Spirit inspired. And this is a good point to make is sometimes I watch YouTube and I definitely shouldn't. And I watched a lady this past, what was on Monday or so when I was sick and I was watching things. And this lady comes up and she's a pastor. Do with that what you want. And she comes out and she starts teaching about the Garden of Eden. And I've heard this before, but to come from, it was just insane. And she said, God lied in the Garden of Eden. God lied to Eve. To Eve. And she started going on, and I turned it off after a while, because she was like, this was all about uh, empowering women. That's what she said, that the Garden of Eden was about empowering women. And then she totally turned the whole thing. And next thing you know, we're talking about pro-abortion and everything else. I'm like, where did we get here? How did we, what, what is this? There is so much teaching today, it's crazy, is it not? We have to be on guard from what we're hearing and what we're doing. And the first thing, again, it comes back to, are we in prayer? Are we seeking the Holy Spirit? Because Peter's reading through Psalms and these things speak to him. And I bet if we went through and we didn't have this, we would read these Psalms and not think that this is about Judas. But Peter, the Holy Spirit, I believe, spoke to him and said that this place needs filled. Now, whether you agree that it should be him or not, we'll get to that later. But the Holy Spirit speaks to him, this position needed filled. But be on guard. One, one of the uh, pastors I listened to a while ago, again, he's wrong. He goes, I believe the Bible is inspired just like C.S. Lewis is inspired, like the Quran is inspired, and they'll go on and on and on. So it's not authoritative, it's just inspired. And the thing is, they pick and choose from it. And that's what they accuse us of doing, right? So they'll say, well, you guys pick and choose because you'll go, you'll, you probably eat, you know, we're from Maryland, we eat crabs, right? Well, that's not in the Old Testament. You can't do that. That's against the Old Testament law. And then they'll talk about tattoos and they'll go, they'll go on, on all these different things and say, they'll say, see, you pick and choose. And then you have to sit down and you have to talk to them. Well, that's old covenant. We're under a new covenant. And they're like, see, but you're picking and choosing. But that's why we need to decipher scripture for, for ourselves. And I challenge you all, please don't just be listening to me. Please be reading other commentaries. Listen to other expositional teaching. Go through, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir. I think most of you do it. Listen to other people. Find out what they're saying. If you don't like what I'm going to say about Paul and and Matthias at the end of this, go listen to somebody else. I read four different people, and two are on each side. So go and challenge yourself. 
Scripture talks about all the time to, to study to show yourself approved. You are showing yourself approved. Don't study to show Matt approved. I have to study to show myself approved. And I'm doubly accountable because you guys are all sitting here listening to me, which I wonder about all the time. Why are they here? Why are they listening to me? But hey, Scripture is clear. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Word of God is there for every good work, and that's what's going through with Peter in this place. He's going through, he read the Scriptures, they're speaking to him, I believe, led by the Holy Spirit, and there's a work that needs to be completed. <clears throat> We get to this weird place in this where he talks about the falling headlong. And I remember being a teenager, I got really challenged on this. Because if you read in the other Gospels, it says Judas hung himself and he died. And here in Acts, it says that he fell headlong and it burst open. And I'm not going to get too graphic, but you, you know what it says. And I was told that this is a contradiction in Scripture. So being the teenager that I was at the time, I dug in. I did not like the word to be challenged, and I was probably very prideful, and I was so I started digging in, but the Lord humbled me. So there's two possibilities of this. And again, I'll try not to get real graphic. One of it is that he hung himself with the rope, and this is what most people prescribe to, and the rope broke, and he fell over, and he burst open, right? The problem I found with that is, for one, he would have had to been hanging pretty high, and it says he went headlong. So it means he went head first down into it. So he would have had to have been on top of a cliff or something else, which is possible, right? I believe scripture is true, right? I don't have to find a way to justify it. But there is historical context to this. And I'm going to try to be careful because we have little ones here. When people committed suicide in this day, they did not use ropes by and large. They impaled themselves. They would set, a, they would set up a pike and they would jump on it. You remember in the scripture, it also says that Jesus was hung on a tree. We know he didn't use a rope. We know he was crucified. It says it over and over again that they hung themselves. If you go back to um, Esther, when, when he's hung, it says he's hung on a huge gallows. That most likely was not rope. He was probably impaled on a pike way, way up in the sky. So more than likely what Judas did is he jumped on one and everything spilled out. That's my conclusion that I come to. So now that you're all horrified just looking at me, that's the conclusion that I came to. That's what I think it's most likely is. And you can take that to somebody who wants to argue with you because historical context can be very important and it'll help you when you understand that tree hanging was not common. All right, we'll get past that now. Verse 21 through 23, These things, therefore of these men who have accomplished us all at this time, that the Lord Jesus, and I want to stop there and just take note. They say Lord Jesus from here on out. I know we covered that in John. He is never Jesus or just Jesus when they speak about him anymore. He is never teacher Jesus, rabbi Jesus. He is Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is always Lord to them from here on out once he is resurrected. And they make it very clear, and they will say it over and over again. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, he is Lord to them now. He is no longer just their teacher. They recognize him as that, and have we not lost that? One of the problems I, I, I heard a Calvary pastor talking about that happened through the 60s movement, and everything that happened is we got so familiar with Jesus, we forgot the balance that he is also Lord. That yes, we have a friend in Jesus, but he is also our Lord. He is our God. He is our King. And the balance is always that, is it not? Most of us, when we have problems in our marriage or problems every, everywhere else, it's not that Jesus isn't our friend, it's our problem, it's we forgot he's Lord, and he is Lord of our life. Because if we've made him Lord first, a lot of the other problems would go away. So the Lord Jesus went in and out among them, beginning with the baptism of John, to that day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection, and they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. So again, he knew that this must be replaced. Peter understood that. He stood up, and, and he comes up with these conditions. So I'm going to take this in two ways. I'm going to take it that Peter was right, and I'm also going to take it that Peter was wrong. 
and because there's applications in both of those. So the first thing is that I think that um, the conditions he puts on this are good. All the other disciples have seen and have been there since Jesus was baptized and they were there at the ascension. I think that's good. Uh, one commentator said it's a logical, common sense requirement. And sometimes in life, as we pray and we seek the Lord, sometimes we make decisions based on logical, common sense requirements. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Where, where we get in error is when we try to make decisions out of emotion, isn't it? When we're angry, when we're upset, we say something we shouldn't or charge in and make a decision when we shouldn't have. Sometimes making a logical, common sense requirement decision is a good thing. God has given us a mind to evaluate things. Again, it's, um, I think it was not C.S. Lewis. I can't remember his name. Very popular Christian commentator. Um, but he talked about, you know, we're told to give, right? That's one thing the Lord instructs us to do, to give. But we should use all our common sense in that. Just don't go give money to anything. Investigate who you're going to giving money to. Where does that money go? How are they handling it? What are they doing with it? If you're giving it to missions, there is a lot of corrupt mission organizations, unfortunately. Be careful. Evaluate it. Use common sense and go through and evaluate it. Just don't give because the Lord says give, though we should. But he's expecting us to use all our common sense, all, all of our mind to make decisions uh, for where he's leading us to do. So they propose these two guys. And I'm kind of glad it was Matthias because imagine putting the name Joseph called Barabbas, whose name, surname was Jesus on one of the stones in, in Revelation, right? That's a, that's a long name. Matthias is probably a little bit easier to just chisel up in there. But there's these two names. And what we have a habit of doing is we limit God to two choices, don't we? We'll say, God, I'm going to give you multiple choice, A, B, or C. And meanwhile, God's up there and he says, I don't know. It's none of those. I don't have any of those things for you. And we have a bad habit of doing that. We limit God in our decisions because we'll give him A or B decisions when it's something totally else. You give God a way out. And not that he needs a way out, but when you're praying and you're making decisions, do you give him an out? Make sure you give him an out. Not my will, but your will, Jesus would pray. And then be open to it. Because most of the time we're so single focused. Maybe I'm speaking for myself. I'm so single focused that I'm going to charging toward A. When meanwhile God's like, it's not A or B, Matt. I have D. You don't, I mean, you're not even there yet. And what I'm doing is I'm charging ahead when the Lord's saying, will you sit and wait? Because it's not time yet. And if Paul had been the decision, what Jesus would have been telling Peter, the Holy Spirit would have been telling Peter is wait. It wasn't the time yet. What you're doing is right. This position needs filled, and I have something for it, but you need to wait on me. You're charged ahead. And don't we do that? Reading all the commentators and listening to the pastors this week, they say the biggest problem that comes from the people in the church, the biggest thing that they have to deal with is people who did not wait upon the Lord, and they know it. What are we told to do before marriage? Wait. What are we, we told to do as we make decisions in life with the Lord? Wait. Don't rush into this. Because usually when we rush in, that's when the problems happen, isn't it? We'll rush into a business decision we shouldn't have. We'll rush into a financial decision we shouldn't have. And the whole time, the Lord's been saying, I just need you to wait. And I hate it. I hate it. Casey and I were talking on the way here. Why is the house not sold yet? There is houses selling all around us. And what he said to me this morning was, wait, Matt, just wait. Do you not think that I have a better blessing for you ahead of you? And that doesn't mean my house is going to be this big, gorgeous house. That's not what it is. It's not about financial blessings. And, and we, had, we talked through this this morning. It's not about getting nicer stuff or nicer things. And I was reminded back to when we went to Cambodia. It was a hit. I didn't have PTO. I didn't know how we were going to pay for this, but the Lord said go. And I look back and it was a financial hit. The blessings in that. And I don't mean financial. I mean what the Lord did through my life and I saw the faithfulness of Jesus. Because when you wait on him, 
and you let him guide you the way that he's going to guide you, you will never not be blessed. Again, it's not about finances. That is too small of a thing. But I credit the walk of my children and the faith that they have because we went to Cambodia not once, not twice, four times and couldn't afford it any of those four times. We don't know how God did it. He just did it. And it's because of that, it's because we waited, because we sought the Lord, that those blessings came through. Don't look for the financial blessings. It's too small of a thing. The whole world's going to burn in the end anyways, right? The blessings are with him. The blessings are watching him be faithful. So wait when he tells you to wait. Do not charge ahead. I could close the whole thing out right there, couldn't I? Because we all need some waiting in life probably. I don't know why I put this on here. Maybe I was still coming off my fever, but I'm going to say it anyways. I don't know how much it applies to you guys. But it was for singles. Because the number one mistake I see that single people make is they charge into a relationship. They want a relationship so bad, and the world will help you find that relationship, won't they? That they charge right into a relationship that they weren't ready for or that is not God-ordained, and that person drags them away from the Lord. And I bet if I asked all of you, you know someone, at least one, probably two or three, that that has happened to. Because they were not patient and they did not wait upon the Lord. And it is, I warned my kids from the time they were probably young, that it is relationships that will tear you down faster than anything else that I've seen in this world because you would not wait on for the Lord to bring the right person along at the right time. Be patient and wait. And I'm looking around, and I know it doesn't apply to a lot of you, but there's people watching, I'm sure. I don't know, it's for somebody. In your marriage, do you invite him in? Do you invite him into the decisions that you're, you're making? And again, are you prepared to wait? And that's what the Lord was speaking to me this week and this morning, very strongly. Are you prepared to wait, Matt? And that's what he has to hammer home to me. Because in, in waiting, I have found is spiritual maturity. I want to be spiritually mature. I think all of us do. And the first thing I will notice when I'm waiting is I will get really impatient. Ever stand at lines, and uh, really long lines? People start getting crazy, don't they? They start getting weird. You go to like amusement parks and you're waiting two hours to go on a roller coaster, or like if you went to Disney or whatever. People get like frustrated, they're aggravated, they're like, why is this taking so long? But what I have found is those who are spiritually mature wait. And the song I'm going to play later is, while I wait, I will worship you. Because in that waiting, he is perfecting us. Because what is the first word that comes out of his mouth when he describes love in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient. And I will find very quickly that I am not patient. And I want to be spiritually mature. I want to grow. So in waiting, he is refining us. And I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. So Peter stands up and he charges in. He gives God two choices, A or B, God. And then it says in verse 24 and 26 that they prayed and said, You, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. I'm glad that he does. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. He might go to his own place, and they cast their lots, and it fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So again, I'm going to take this as a model here. They did what was right. They were following the example of Jesus. Remember, he went away overnight, and he prayed for his 11 or 12 at that point he was going to appoint. So in some ways here, they're modeling Jesus. They have sat, they had prayed, they had sought the Lord. Their hearts were right. They saw in scriptures and they filled it. But casting lots, right? That's where everybody has the problems. Why did they cast lots? Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it is every decision is from the Lord. This is not unheard of in Old Testament practice. There is a lot of times that people cast lots and remember in the, in the Old Testament, they would go to the priest and he had the umum and the thum, thumum. I can't say it. So he had the white stone and the black stone and they would pull them out and it's a yes or a no. It's, it wasn't uncommon in the Old Testament practices to come and do these things. And it says the lot fell on Matthias. 
we can criticize this pretty quick, but isn't our decisions probably even worse than the way that they did it? We will, again, we'll make decisions out of emotion, right? Out of impatience, out of we will just charge right ahead and we'll make it, uh, at least they prayed, at least they sought the Lord and they cast lots. I'm not going to knock them for that. But again, this chapter is closing the Old Testament in some ways, the Old Testament practices, because after this, we're going to see that. Well, I didn't put it up. But it says in Acts 13, 2, it says, the Holy Spirit will say to them, separate unto Paul and Barabbas for the ministry where I have called them. After this, they're going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. He's going to speak to them. And we're going to see, like Paul went here, it says at one point the devil stopped them. He, here, and the Holy Spirit was leading them. The Holy Spirit will lead everything they do after this chapter, after he falls at Pentecost. And I wanted to stop before we get to that chapter. So, okay. Paul or Matthias? Which one was it? And everybody has an opinion. So when I read Chuck Smith, he was all about it's Paul. It should have been Paul all along. Paul was the one that God chose. Paul was the one who was led of God. He's going to write most of the New Testament and really good arguments. And when I got finished reading Chuck, I'm like, yep, should have been Paul. Yep. Well, and then I, so then I'd read Warren Rearsby. He's my favorite. I always go to Chuck and then to him. And he was polar opposite. Nope, it should have been Matthias. See, Matthias was there from the beginning, and the, the, the standards that they met, they went all the way through. He was there at the baptism. He was there at the ascension. He was there, and one of the early church fathers, I don't remember which one, it says that he was one of the 70 that went out two by two and performed miracles and did things. So it should have been him. He was there from the beginning. And you think about when, when they're writing this, that they would have known him really, really well. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it must be him. So then I went to John Corson. John Corson went the way of Chuck. Oh, it must have been Paul. It should have been Paul. All along, it should have been Paul. It, they, they rushed into a decision. And then I listened to Joe Foch. And Joe Foch went back to Mat Matthias and over and back and forth. And this way it went. And here's where I ended. Yep. That's who it is. I don't care. Like it said in Revelation 12, 21, 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I don't care whose stone I'm next to at the city if I have a mansion there. If it's Paul, if it's Matthias, good for them. The only thing I will say that swayed me a little bit by the end of it is it says in Acts 6-2 that the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It said the twelve, and Matthias was in that. So I kind of just rest there now that it might have been him. Is it really important? Nope doesn't really matter. Some will argue and say, well, he's not mentioned again through the rest of Scripture. You're right, but neither is 10 of the 12, or I think it's nine of them. They're not mentioned again either. Matthias, church history says he'll go out. Now, there's three different traditions. I'm not going to get into what happened of them, but all three of them end with him being martyred. That he went out, he preached the gospel, and he preached till he was killed. So whatever it was, he loved Jesus. He had been there from the beginning to the end. He loved Jesus and he died for him. And if his, his name is on the stone, good for him. Paul would say that he was an apostle born out of time. Was he, does that mean he's a different kind of apostle? He was, because he went to the Gentiles. But all of this leads back. They followed the word of God, right? He was to be replaced. They replaced him. They gathered in prayer. They were in unity in fellowship. I imagine the 120 people put together, there was a lot of opinions about this, wasn't there? 120? But their hearts are, they wanted to follow the will of God. And they relied on God. But again, this is the end of an old way. When we get into the next chapter, it is a new way. We will find the falling of the Holy Spirit. I knew I'd be a little bit earlier, but I got an extra song to play. Because the waiting thing really hit me. And I think all of us at some point, we're waiting for something. Maybe you're waiting for a relative to come to Christ. That's a noble thing to be waiting for. And you're praying. And like I read in Acts, he hears it. And things are moving. And we don't always see it. Most of the time we don't see it. 
And he's changing things in the spiritual realm. And like we pray the guys, I, I say every week, he loves them way more than we do. So don't stop praying for the lost ones. Don't stop praying for the loved ones. And even when you're getting tapped out about it, don't stop praying for them. His brothers were there at the end. Don't stop. Keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord for them. Here's it. Two, most of us are probably waiting for something in our life. There's something the Lord's doing. I think we all have a ministry. We all have works he has called us to do. Don't charge ahead into it. One of the pastors I listened to, this was very interesting. He said, I never go when the Lord tells me what he has for the church to do. And I'm like, what? Isn't that backwards? He goes, because the Lord's going to provide what he needs. He'll tell me what he wants, and I will wait for him, but I'm going to wait till he shows me how he wants it done. I'm not going to charge ahead of him. And that church is big. God has blessed it. Don't charge ahead. I want to charge ahead a lot. But wait and be patient. So I have four songs, like I said. I know we usually close with three. The, one, the first one's about waiting. And it's a little bit slower, so take time. If you want, if you want to worship the Lord, go ahead and just listen to it. Maybe there's something you need to surrender. Maybe there's something that's uh, pressing on you, but it's not what God has for you right now. It might be it's a later thing. But be patient and wait and just surrender those things. Um, so let me close in prayer, and then we'll play these songs. Father, I, Lord, I'm so impatient. I get so worked up so easy about things that don't even really matter in the long run. Help me to be more patient. Help all of us to be more patient, to wait on you. Lord, for those of us waiting for those that are lost to come to you, Lord, I, I know you hear us. I know you're shaping and you're changing things, Lord. So I pray that you would. Shape and change our own hearts too, Lord. Help us to be patient. Give us that power to be witnesses in the lives of those we love. Use us, Lord. And Lord, just again, help us to be patient. Help us to mature in you, to grow in you, and to just seek you as we wait, Lord. I love you and praise you. We offer these songs up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.